This past uh, Thursday, I uh, met a female nonagenarian. She told me she was channel surfing on the television when she came across the Christian channel and uh, was listening to a preacher who, in her words, was teaching, quote, all Christians should be rich. The prosperity gospel's raw message says, God wants you, and I'm talking about you believers, uh, God wants you to be rich. God wants you to trust him and ask him to make you rich. And if you do that, he will make you rich. One of Great Britain's uh, largest Christian annual events is the International Gathering of Champions. Uh, it's where preachers tell the attendees God wants them rich, then richer, and even richer. T.D. Jakes is elevated as an example of what they're talking about. His personal worth, his fortune, is estimated at about $100 million. One of the preachers of this type of belief. Nigeria has a myriad of dilapidated signs and little church properties uh, that house such teaching. And they've titled their places of worship, for instance, The Winner's Chapel or Power Word Church. As well, in Nigeria, you'll find a very large cathedral-like structure in the capital city. And it's led by an archbishop whose books are titled Power Pillars for Success, Uncommon Success. Or another title, Sure Guarantee for a Top Life. Some in Ghana have even altered their wedding vows as such. For better, for best, for richer, for richest. By the millions all over the globe, the prosperity pseudo-gospel has overwhelmingly uprooted the authentic biblical gospel. In American churches today, heresy abounds through teaching on health and wealth, teaching on abortion, gender identity, and that all religions worship the same God. A similar replacement of the gospel, Christ's gospel, had taken place at the church at Ephesus, which is why Paul spurred on Timothy to stay where he was and prodded him to address both the false gospel that was in the church at Ephesus as well as to teach the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In today's text, Paul is doing two things. Jesus Christ led him to reject the Ephesian church's evil teaching and conduct. And... He is correcting it with God's word on creation and prayer. I'll say that again. The whole passage can be put in this one sentence. Paul, led by the Spirit of God, is rejecting the Ephesian church's doctrine, which is evil, as well as their conduct that follows that doctrine. 
and then he's correcting it with God's word on creation and prayer. I'd like to front load uh, this message also by addressing what is the application for today's message? And this is what I would ask of you. Believer, evaluate your beliefs, your conduct, and see if your beliefs and conduct are according to God's word. That's what we need to take home. And I trust the Holy Spirit would help us consider that as we go through this message. Are my beliefs, is my conduct according to the word of God? That's what we need to evaluate. So if you would, please turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5 is where we'll be today. And those five verses divide pretty evenly into two parts. The structure is that it, starting at verse 1 through the middle of verse 3, Paul is led by God to give evidence of evil at the church of Ephesus. Evil is in the church. The second part, from the middle of 3 all the way through 5, is that Paul presents evidence of goodness evidence of goodness for the church at Ephesus, and of course for us. So if you would, please stand as we would read from God's Word, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, a message I've titled, Evil Conduct Corrected. But the Spirit explicitly says, that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seared in their own conscience as with a branding iron. Men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. Pray with me. Father God, Thank you for warning us of demon-serving schemers who lead believers astray. Lord Jesus, you identified yourself with two simple words, gentle and humble of heart. Help us, especially us who think I will never, or I would never, believe false doctrine. Instead, keep us humbly needing your Holy Spirit's teaching and needing to study the very scriptures that you have given us. Keep me or any member from planting seeds of false teaching at Southern Oaks. By the grace of our Lord Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. The Apostle Paul supplied evidence of evil 
at the church in Ephesus, and he supplied it in a very orderly way. Uh, he starts by describing an evil situation there. And that's found in the very first part of verse 1. So there's an evil situation. He follows that up with an evil source. An evil source. And that's the last part of verse 1. He moves on and he concludes or excuse me, he continues to identify evil, this time by evil servants who are doing this work. An evil situation, an evil source through evil servants. And then he concludes with evil asceticism, evil asceticism. And we'll get into the word meaning and things like that in a minute. The evil asceticism is found at the very first part of verse 3. The Ephesian situation commences with the word but. A very important word because what Paul's doing is showing this is the very opposite of what I've just been talking about. If you remember, Jeff pointed out last Sunday that really the key verse of the entire epistle is verse 15, chapter 3, where uh, Paul writes how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. There is a right way, a holy way. And that's why Paul was writing this entire epistle to help Timothy and the church at Ephesus do what's right. But... Now Paul comes to the but, but it's as if he's saying, now I'm about to clarify what kind of evil teaching and conduct is in the church right now. A very, very black and white type of contrast. The Ephesian believers should not be surprised that evil has made its nest in the very church where they worship. Because the Holy Spirit explicitly, clearly had said so in the past that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith. The force of the verb, the Holy Spirit explicitly says, the force of that word says indicates it was said in the past, its reality is in the present, and there's more of it to come in the future. That's the force of the verb. Past, present, future, and that's called the latter days here in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit led various New Testament writers to communicate this apostasy and foretell it. It's found, for instance, in Mark's gospel and in other parts of the gospels. It's found in Paul's writings. Particularly, it's found in the pastoral epistles. First and Second Timothy and Titus talks about this apostasy. But it doesn't stop there. Peter wrote about this apostasy. And John, the Apostle John, wrote about it in 1 John. Jude records it in verses 17 and 18. So it's not something that's unknown. It's been made very clear and multiple times. Uh, the Holy Spirit wants us to know this reality has begun, is here today, will be here tomorrow, and in a sense, to its summit before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to just point out the clarity of it in Acts 20, verse 30, when Paul foretold uh, about some in Ephesus who would fall away. He predicted it, quote, from among your own selves in the church, men will arise speaking 
perverse things. Perverse, stubbornly against what is right. That's the word perverse. They're going to rise and speak stubbornly against what's right. Quote, to draw away the disciples after them. That's the purpose of this apostasy. Well, the clarity of the upcoming apostasy had already arrived in Ephesus. It's very clear, and it's being stated by the apostle here in this pericope. And its present existence is supported by the, la- the phrase, in the latter times. A study of this phrase uh, would reveal that the latter times falls between two major events. It begins at the first coming of Christ, and the latter times ends at the second coming of Christ, when he will set everything right. So that is the time frame of this phrase, in the latter times. Uh, The Apostle John supported this very view in 1 John 4.3. These are his words, quote, the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard about, is coming and is already in the world. They had heard about it, that it's going to be coming. It's already here, and it'll continue. In a moment, Paul refers to active evil spirits, demonic spirits in the church at Ephesus. It's amazing, but it's true. So the situation prophesied by the Holy Spirit had arrived in which some, not all in Ephesus, but some in the church at Ephesus will fall away from the faith. The words fall away are from one Greek word that's used 14 times in the New Testament. Ten out of the 14 times, the word from is attached to it. To fall away from. And uh, basically it tells you what they're falling away from. And if you look here, they are falling away from the faith. To fall away means to go away from. It means to withdraw, to separate yourself from the Lord and his word. That's what you're going away from. Incidentally, the word fall away is never passive. It is an activity that a person chooses deliberately to do. Apostasy is another word that is used instead of fall away. A person apostatizes. And when they do that, they deliberately repudiate and abandon the faith that they once said they believed in. And this is found, an example of it, in Hebrews 3.12. Quote, Take care, brethren, lest there should be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart in falling away from the living God to repudiate and abandon the living God. So basically, there are heretics, and heretics deny some aspect of the Bible. For instance, the prosperity gospel people would say, Christians should never be poor. That's a heresy. But they really believe that, and they're saying Christians should always be rich. So that's a heresy, but... There are a lot of Christians in the prosperity gospel movement. 
They believe the Lord Jesus Christ is God, and they believe he's the only Savior, but they're obviously believing a false doctrine. That would be a heresy. But when we come to apostasy, well, an apostate leaves the Christian faith completely. We've had some of those well-known Christians who are now clearly telling us I repudiate the Bible, God, salvation by grace through faith in Jesus. I used to believe that, but I no longer hold to that. These are of national um, names that you and I would be familiar with. However, remember that it's possible for a person to deny the faith, to deny Christ, as the Apostle Peter did. But the difference with the Apostle Peter is that he repented of it and he went to with Jesus and Jesus was so gentle with him and he reaffirmed his belief in the Lord and continued then to follow Jesus. But if an apostate totally defects, never repents, he is worthy of divine wrath and condemnation forever. Well, I need to consider our application up to this point. You and I may hold, probably unknowingly, some false teaching. Uh, I feel like I'm always growing and learning, uh, and I'm sometimes surprised that what I thought was true is not true. And we're always wanting to be more accurate about what the Bible teaches. And we should never be stagnant and never say, I know it all. And all that I know is perfectly correct. That cannot be. But we're growing and we don't want to have false teaching in us. However, if there is someone here who has totally rejected the gospel, totally rejected that God is even in existence, or that salvation is only by Christ through repentance and faith, then that person is an apostate if they once believed in Christ and were saved. And so... The simple question is, where are you? Where am I? What do I really believe? May the Lord help us, each one of us, so that we can have assurance from the Holy Spirit to whom we belong. Why? Because of Christ's ministry of salvation through the cross and our trust in him alone, and not in anything else. Well, the evidence of evil, first of all, there's this evil situation. The second thing is that there's an evil source to its taking place at the church in Ephesus. Those who fell away, the apostates, totally rejected the gospel, were, quote, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons. To pay attention, the word literally means to be totally devoted to. They had been devoted to something else, and now their heart is given to something different. So they're devoted to demons, and they are devoted to those teachings from the demons. Once again, to pay attention cannot be made by a passive type of situation. It is an active choice by the person. You literally give yourself over to this teaching, and whether you know it or not, It originates from demons. And so you are now united in your soul, in your being, 
to these teachings that are demonic in nature. They are called deceitful, seducing, evil spirits who are against biblical truth, who are against the Lord Jesus Christ in all his purity and his gospel's truth. And what they do is they replace biblical truth and disseminate heretical error in the church at Ephesus. And they're doing that in a lot of places all over the world in various churches. Notice that it says some, some became apostates. That also means that there are some Christians who are listening and are beginning to move in this direction because they're also being influenced by the false teachers at Ephesus. They just haven't apostatized at this point. Some probably will, but some won't. By the grace of God, they'll be saved from believing and giving themselves over. But these immature, young, maybe, young Christians, we've seen them in many churches, they begin to believe something that's wrong. And so they begin to follow it. And so there are believers in the church at Ephesus that become yo-yos to these apostates, following them, and to the false teachers. The apostates are being directed and personally are engaged with demons. And these demons are feeding them this false doctrine. This is supported from 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 26, the very next epistle where Paul describes the apostates as being, quote, in the snare of the devil. Uh, have you ever seen an animal that got trapped and it clamped on them and they're trying to escape and they can't? Uh, they're ensnared. They're caught. They do not have the ability to move away and get away from the devil. They have gone that far. And then Paul goes on to say, having been held captive by him to do his will. So now they're captured in their mind and in their soul and in their being And this is what they want to do, and they're choosing to do it, and Satan will never let them go. So we have a situation, and we have a source that is feeding the situation. How do demons do this? I couldn't tell you, but I can tell you one aspect of how they do it. Through servants. They have servants whom they use to accomplish what is going on at Ephesus and in churches. So verse 2 gives us a second description about apostates. The apostates have people who are serving them, leading them. That's what it says. The means by which the demons do their activity is through liars. These are the false teachers that are leading the whole event at Ephesus. So the demons have a go-between, you might say. They have these false teachers in their hands, and these false teachers are trying to get more and more involved with them. These false teachers are liars, and they're called hypocrites. A hypocrite is someone who pretends to be something that they're not. So what are they pretending? They're pretending to be Christians in the church. They know the lingo. They know the behavior. 
and yet truly it's a mask they're pretending but in reality they are completely with the false teaching and the demons that gave it to them and their purpose is to get more Christians more people to follow their false teaching why are they so committed these apostates these false teachers excuse me there are apostates the people that's one group they're following the false teachers they've left the faith because the false teachers have brought them to that point so there are believers there are false teachers and then their disciples are the apostates the three different groups at the church in Ephesus so why are these false teachers so committed well it says here because these liars have had their conscience seared as with a branding iron if you've ever been around cattle or sheep sometimes these ranchers will brand what they own and in the history of branding um, when criminals ran away when runaway slaves were caught when captured soldiers were looked at or members of a religious cult they would find brands and that would tell them who owns them and so what we have here Paul is declaring by the word of the very Holy Spirit who tells the truth these false teachers have been branded by Satan he has entered their very minds and conscience and has put his stamp on them seared them so that they are his they do not belong to the Lord they belong to Satan that's what Paul is making very clear do you see how important this epistle and this portion how important it is to the church at Ephesus they needed to understand what's really going on and if I told you or any other church uh, there are demons that are out to destroy this church some of us would probably agree but how serious and so Paul is wanting to make absolutely clear what is really going on in the church at Ephesus Satan who owns these false teachers is at work through them in the future there's going to be a 666 brand of the Antichrist and it'll have the same effect as this is having at the church in Ephesus so the false teachers would be these kinds of people evil is good and good is evil and their conscience doesn't bother them at all <clears throat> well the evidence that there is evil at the church is substantiated by Paul describing the situation the source the servants that Satan is using and then lastly there is evil asceticism a s c e t i c i s m asceticism it is a way of life and the way of life goes like this i'm going to deny myself certain things so that i can gain god's approval and god's righteousness if I will do this and discipline myself I'm going to be a better Christian and a God will give me his approval and then I'll be right with God through what I do can you see 
This is a false gospel. It's about what I do and not about what Christ has done. Well, there are certain signs that these false teachers uh, foist upon the church. The first sign that you really are with us is if you will not marry. Self-denial, don't marry. The second sign, stay away from these foods. And if you do that, that'll really show to God that you want him to approve of you and accept you. So what we have here really is I can do something that replaces what Jesus has done. They're not telling them that, I don't think. But that's the bottom line. Now, a couple of real short questions. Who created marriage? God. Who created food? God. So if God created marriage, is it good? If God created food, is it good? So really what these guys are saying is, go against God in this way, and he will make you right with him. <laughs> evil is good, and good is evil. Well, what we've seen is there's an evil situation, an evil source, evil servants, and evil asceticism in this passage. And now we come to the last half of the passage, evidence of goodness, evidence of goodness. And it has to do with creation that God created, and it has to do with prayer. So Paul does not address, at this point anyway, uh, this thing about marriage or not being married. He will do it later in chapter 5. And at this point, he's only going to address food and abstaining from food uh, and is going to show us what is good about food, why is it good, and uh, so that, in a sense, people will hear the truth and, by the power of the Holy Spirit, break what they have committed to in their hearts, the power of God. He wants to free them from this enslavement. So at this point, he addresses only the topic of food, and he says food is good because God created it. And food is good because prayer confirms that the food is good to eat. That's the simple aspect of what I'm about to address. Three times, Paul says, food was created by God. Look at verse 3 in the very middle. He says, foods which God has created. Verse 4, he adds a little bit more of this truth. For everything created by God is good. And he's trying to say, say look, this contradicts totally what you're being taught at Ephesus. Verse 5, food is sanctified, that is, it is useful and it is good for the intake by means of the word of God. God says food is good. And so Paul is saying, basically, I'm going with Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good, very good. Jesus himself declared all foods to be clean, Mark 7, 19. So Paul, through Timothy, is establishing in the church at Ephesus, the false teachers say, food, certain foods you shouldn't eat. 
but God says they're good. Jesus says it's good. Is God and Jesus wrong? You're following false, evil teaching, basically. Paul says food is good because God made it. And when Christians believe the truth, as it says there at the end of verse 3, when Christians believe what's true and know the truth, what are they going to do? It says they're gratefully going to share in it. And, you know, we're sitting around the table. We're going to share food. We have fellowship with one another. And we are gratefully sharing in it. What is gratefully referred to? We take time to thank God for it. We're grateful, Lord. And we bow our heads, often at mealtimes, and we say, Lord, you made this. We're so thankful you provided it to nourish our bodies. You're a good God. Thank you. Amen. Well, that's what this is saying. Christians who know the truth are going to thank God for any and every kind of food. And so we now move to the whole aspect the second time about prayer is good. It's a way to say God is good. And that's found at verse 4. Excuse me. Yes, verse 4. So first he says, everything God made is good. Nothing is to be rejected. Nothing. None of the food. It is to be received with, there's that word again, gratitude. We receive this, Lord, with grateful hearts. Now, I need to make a point here. Obviously, um, some of the people that Paul addresses have been eating food that was dedicated to idols. Do you remember that? 1 Corinthians and others. Uh, and then there were those who says, I can't eat that. It was dedicated to idols. And Paul says, you know, there's really nothing wrong with that food, even if it was dedicated to idols. But some people have a conscience, you know, and in their conscience, they cannot eat that food. They should not be put down for not eating it. And if you feel free in your conscience to eat it, and they see you eat it, the person should not put you down for eating it because each one is doing according to his conscience. And the bottom line is, there is food on the table that each of those people can eat. And they're thanking God for it. Now, it may not include what was offered to idols, and for some people, that's broccoli. <laughs> they cannot eat. They don't like the texture of broccoli. I know a friend, my wife knows a friend, if that person eats certain foods, they get sick. Sick. So they can't eat that food. That's fine. That's fine. But they can eat other food. And so the point is, whatever we receive... By faith, we're going to thank God for it. And the last, the third time, once again, he says, this food is sanctified because God's word says so, and, notice, and through prayer. When I pray and thank God, it gives him glory that he provided all the food that we can eat. Do you recall the application that we're to have? I mentioned it at the beginning of the message. Believers, evaluate your beliefs and your conduct to see if it's according to scriptural truth. How will a Christian know if what he believes is correct? How will he or she know if her conduct is right and pleasing to God? It's real simple. By reading his word. If you never read God's word, 
How will you know, really, what God says is true? You must read the Word of God. And so I have some questions for all of us. Are you reading God's Word? And this is not to put anybody on a guilt trip, but how often do you read God's Word? Is it just on Sunday when we come to church? Or maybe one other time during the week, you sit down and read for five minutes or whatever in the Bible. Well, my question is, can you really learn that much if you read it once in a while? Have you studied? Have you meditated? Have you reflected on a verse or two and actually taken some time to understand it. Have you read it and found a unanswerable question in your heart? I don't know what that means. That's a good thing. Because, see, then you can come to another brother or sister, to one of the elders, and say, you know, I was reading this. Can you help me understand it? That's a wonderful place to be. I want to know. I want to grow. I want to know God better. I want to know the truth. And so my question is, on a weekly basis, how often do you read the scripture? Is it the same number of times that Satan would want you to read it by any chance? He wouldn't want you to read it very often, would he? If you don't study scripture, or let's just say you don't know how to study scripture. I have a very good suggestion for you. Come to Sunday school. Have you ever sat under Dr. Mack? God has worked in that man's heart, and he is a student of the Bible. And he presents truth very clearly, little by little, every Sunday morning. If you're not there and you're not studying the Bible, something's wrong. You've got to find time to study and learn and make time. How easy it would be to watch television preachers teach false doctrine and think, that sounds pretty good. I like that. She just preached this. He's just said, I can pray for riches. I'm going to send this handkerchief my way by giving them money. I need that thing. See, we, we easily can be strayed. I am just as able to fall in teaching as anybody else. And each of us is responsible to God to find out, is that the truth? Each of us. Reading, contemplating, studying, evaluating. Oh, just kind of letting it stay in your heart and mind. And the blessing of the Spirit's teaching. That's what we need. Verses 1 through 5 is one sentence in the Greek. It has several clauses, but it's one sentence. The evil situation is that some believers have fallen away. They have fallen away just like the Spirit of God said they would. And I call them believers because that's what they would have called themselves. There is an evil source in apostasy. Church members who devote themselves to demons and demonic teaching. That's where the source of false teaching comes from. There are evil servants. They're hypocrites. They may appear, they may sound like professing Christians, but they're liars. They hide it very well. 
And I think it's in Corinthians it says, even Satan appears as an angel of light. So they're not going to tell you, I got this from a demon. They're not going to tell you that. They're going to tell you this is what God said. God told me. I found it in the Bible. Whatever. Well, then there's evil asceticism. It's twofold. Forbidding what God has said is good. Marriage and food. But always remember, God created marriage. And God created food. Let's give him the glory and the credit for what he's done. Father, we're so thankful for a time to be um, disturbed, awakened of the actual spiritual warfare that is taking place that we don't usually talk about. It's an unseen and for many of us unknown situation. And yet, we see the consequences in churches, denominations, Christians all over the world taken by false teachers. I pray, Lord, for Southern Oaks that you would help us want to be in the Word, Help us to discipline ourselves so that we read and study and go be under good teaching, being willing to do what it takes to know you better. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You're our only hope for salvation and for growth. May your Holy Spirit have his way in my beliefs and in my conduct. Continue in prayer as Sarah plays, please.